Hello and welcome to a podcast about something where each week we dive deep into whatever it is we find interesting. I'm your host, Calvin, and joining me is a very special guest today from the CinemaSins YouTube channel. It is Jeremy Scott. Hello. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you for having me. I, I'm really excited to be here. I was just telling you before we start recording that, you know, I'm a huge fan. I've been watching CinemaSins for like eight or nine years now. Um, so this is a great opportunity and, I, and I'm glad to have you. Um, I'm just afraid. Like the ding is going to be going off in the back of my head this whole time. Every time you say something, I'm, I'm going to be waiting for the ding at the end of your sentence. I have people tell me that a lot. Uh, <laughs> maybe I should carry around a bell. <laughs> I th- maybe. That might be a good idea. Um, so for listeners who are new uh, to you, why don't you tell them what the Cinema Sins YouTube channel is and kind of where it came from and, and what goes on there? Sure. Um, it's a, a place for uh, obsessive nitpicking of movies um in the name of fun um it was started uh by my my good friend and now business partner chris atkinson and i uh back in december of 2012 we uh had been dabbling in several uh, youtube ideas uh, we'd written about youtube a lot we were very interested in making our own videos and everything we tried was movie related but we we had a round of failures uh, before we settled on this format uh, that ended up taking off. And so basically we just go through a movie and pick out the quote unquote sins. Sometimes a sin is a mistake uh, or continuity error. Sometimes uh, a sin is just an observation or pointing out how many lamps are in a room. Um, but I it's, all, that one. it's all in the name of fun. Um, you know, basically we're big mystery science theater 3000 fans and we watched movies together at the movie theater when we both managed there together and we would just you know talk throughout the movie and make jokes and comments and that sort of planted the seed for what would become cinema sins yeah and so i've i've through doing this podcast i've talked to a lot of other content creators and it's usually whatever state they're in in content creation is never where they started right it, it's always yeah. You, you've always felt this need to to create content and, um, you know, even going back to when I was in college, me and one of my friends, we'd just make these silly YouTube videos and, and try and get people to watch them. And, you know, I've, I've tried several times at writing different blogs and things like that, and I, I don't have the time or energy to put into that. And I landed on the podcast and it's really been helpful to for that creative outlet. And yeah. it's, it's always interesting to see kind of all those steps that people take to get to where okay, this is the thing that I'm going to keep going with rather than, oh, I tried this, it didn't work. I tried this, it didn't work. But but now I finally found something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you had a couple other projects outside of CinemaSins. Uh, your first novel was The Ables. Uh, why don't you tell listeners about that? Sure. Uh, the Ables is a um, superhero series uh, where the, the, the main characters in my stories are disabled individuals um and uh <clears throat> they start out as teenagers and uh they end up in college by the third book and then the fourth book which i'm writing now uh they'll be adults with their own kids uh, but yeah i was interested in the idea of a superhero story um where someone was caught in between two worlds like you know usually we either see the human perspective of the superheroes like uh, Jimmy Olsen, or we see the superheroes perspective like Superman. But what about somebody who isn't really accepted in either of those realms? And so uh, my characters all have disabilities that directly impact uh, their ability to use their superpowers. My main character is blind, but his superpower is telekinesis, moving things with his brain. But how will he do that without being able to see? Um, and so the story is about how they refuse to be told they can't be heroes and work together, um, find ways to maximize their abilities to uh, save the day. And uh, it's not a runaway hit or a bestseller, but I get good feedback um, from readers, especially readers with disabilities who are happy to see the representation there. Um, and that is all I need. That is good stuff there. And so I'm going to finish the fourth book here in a few months and wrap it up. Yeah. No, uh, movie deal incoming for the Ables yet though. Mm-mm. <laughs> Not so uh, far. 
I I have started I started reading the the first one and I think it's really interesting. It's it's kind of a mix of Sky High meets um you know any other superhero story and I I really like I I think it's well written and I forget sometimes as I'm reading it or I I do it on audiobook so as a, on audiobook so as I'm listening to it I forget that the main character is blind sometimes and then it, it just kind of hits me when he's like he can't understand how something works or he can't understand who's speaking at times sometimes and then I'm like well, why can't he why can't he figure this out? And then I'm like, oh yeah. And it hits me and it's, it's written in a way where, you know, the blindness is never used as a crutch or, or none of the disabilities that any of the characters have are used as a crutch, but as a, uh, just something they've learned to deal with. So they're at that point in their life where they know how to deal with it, but now they have to deal with that disability and come to grips with their superpowers, which is, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was, it was, it was, I'm disabled. I, uh, have less than half of my hearing remaining. Um, and uh, I also wrestle with uh, anxiety and depression. And it was important not to use that stuff as a crutch, not to make it the main trait even of my characters. Uh, it's there and, and uh, the disabilities play a part in, in the story and the action, but it's not, it's not something I wanted to <clears throat> overwrite, if you will. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to take advantage of those conditions as a writer. But, you know, I did struggle myself to remember that he was blind. I'd get notes from my editor, uh, like the 20th chapter going, um, he can't see this because he's supposed to be blind. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. And so uh, coming up soon in May, uh, you have a new book coming out, which is uh, more of a memoir. So uh, mm-hmm. can you tell us a little bit about that? And then we'll move into our five fundamental somethings about cinema sins. Excellent. Uh, yeah, it's called Original Sin. Uh, from Preacher's Kid to the Creation of Cinema Sins. And uh, it's part humor, part memoir, part, um, I guess, advice. Um, there's one whole chapter devoted to YouTube advice, because if there's one thing I get asked a lot, it's for YouTube advice. Um, so I wanted to make sure I put actual, usable, actionable advice in the book somewhere. Uh, but the rest of it is basically hopping between three phases of my life when I was a preacher's kid, when I managed movie theaters and then cinema sins, and sort of talking about my relationship to movies in each of those three phases. Um, and there are some what I think are fun, humorous stories of trips that Chris and I have taken since cinema sins started. Um, but it really is just a, a love poem to movies and uh you know, trying to tell my story um, and how how I have evolved over the years as a lover of film. It's super R-rated, though. I want to make crystal clear to anybody that reads The Ables, which is uh, targeted at young adults, uh, that the original sin is full of swearing, um, and it's not bleeped like the Sins videos, so people <laughs> should be aware going in. Well, and we're, we're no stranger to, to swearing on this podcast, so if you need to let it fly, go ahead. Uh, Excellent. Thank you. There. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm excited. That sounds really interesting. I'm excited to, to kind of hear from that because I think, especially with the, the YouTube portion, that, that can go into any content creation. A lot of the things that works for YouTube works for everything. It works for podcasting. It works for writing. And, you know, there's there's going to be some stuff, I'm sure, that is very specific to YouTube, but... There's also a lot of if you're in the content creation business, it all works in the same ways. I hope so. I hope so. A lot of the YouTube advice that I give is is what people might term common sense. Um, like whatever you want your video to, to show up in search results for, you should use those keywords in your video title. Like that seems like common sense, but people don't do it. And uh, so hopefully uh, people who are really looking for a leg up, um, we'll find something usable there and everybody else might just have a chuckle. Yeah. So that should be really good. Uh, when's the release on that? Uh, May 18th. That's just, uh, just under a month away. Yep. And, uh, so this will release in a, uh, about a week and a half from today. So it'll be even closer by then. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> so we are going to go right into our five fundamental somethings about cinema sins. We're going to talk cinema sins. We're going to talk the actual sins, uh, your outlook on movies, in general, uh, all the sin spinoffs, because there are some other channels out there now. And then we're going to talk about uh, some mental health awareness and advocacy within media, uh, because I know that's a big part of Cinema Sins and um, The Ables and I'm sure your your new book as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we already kind of talked about where the idea of sending movies came from, but more to that point, was it difficult for you to go from just, you know, going to the movies, watching a movie, and now you're into this critique or sinning mode? Because it's not always straight critique. It's also, you know, like you said, it's nitpicking at times. Yeah, it's um, I don't find it difficult to go between. And, and Chris would tell you the same thing. Um, it's just that we both have he's got more experience than me, but we both have 10 years plus experience managing movie theaters and when we were working at the theater they were using film it wasn't all digital like it is today so the job of the projectionist which is what we were is to take the six seven reels of a movie that come in cans and you have to build the movie into one big print that goes on the platter Um, and then we were paid to watch that movie to make sure we hadn't made any mistakes it was glorious Um, and when you do that Every Thursday, um, and you watch two or three of the next weekend's brand new movies every Thursday night, you see so many of the same common tropes. Um, And it really does sort of spoil you um, in a way. Uh, I have to be careful how I talk about this because I don't want to be condescending. It's just that I've (laughs) seen so many movies. It's hard for a movie to surprise me. Um, Right. And when a movie does surprise me, uh, a good example would be something like Parasite um, from a couple of years ago, where I had no idea what was coming next. Uh, it completely removes any snark, sarcasm, anything like that that might be lurking in my brain somewhere. And I don't want to make jokes. I just want to watch and enjoy. But when a movie is following these tropes I've seen over and over again, and I know who the killer is 10 minutes in, um, it becomes easier for the sin hat to slip on. And I will sometimes get in trouble with my wife for making jokes (laughs) about a movie that is not surprising me. (laughs) Um, But uh, I don't find it difficult. Like uh, we've sinned my favorite movie ever, which is the matrix. Uh, We've sinned a lot of great classics that I love. Um, And you know, it's just a different way of looking at it, right? Um, mm-hmm. If you want to enjoy a movie, you're not overanalyzing everything. You're just watching. But if you s- shift gears and, and for, say, forget being entertained, I'm just going to nitpick this thing. Where can I find silly things to point out? It's just a, it's a different way of viewing. Um, so I, ca- I call it a hat. I take on, and put, a, put on and take off the sin hat uh, as needed. That makes sense. And I, I've kind of gotten into the same thing. We do our movie superlatives where we take, you know, a different type of movie and give out awards that kind of follow because all these different types of movies, uh, the, the one we're doing this week or this month is boxing movies. So all these mm-hmm. boxing movies, they follow the same general platform and, you know, you can pick out these things that are the same. So what we're trying to do is find the ones that do it best and worst. And as I'm watching, you know, 15 boxing movies within a month, I, it's it's very easy to pick those things out and be like, okay, this did this good, this did this bad. Yep. And and yep. Sh- like you said, shift gears. And then there's, you know, I'll watch ones that I haven't seen before. Like I just watched Cinderella Man, which I never watched before, and I, I wasn't a huge fan of it, but I could tell the things immediately that it was doing good and and what kind of path it would follow because I had watched nine other boxing movies before. Why do they make so many boxing movies, man? I don't Nobody know. even I, watches it anymore. I I'm, I like boxing movies, but they, they are all, it's like Rocky was made and then they had to make Rocky 20 more times. Yeah. And then Million Dollar it. Baby was made and they had to do that a few more times. <laughs> and they, yeah, they just can't, there, there are a lot of interesting stories within boxing because I think they can focus on a singular person. Whereas like if you're talking, if you're making a football movie or a basketball movie, you're going to, you, you have to focus on the team, but boxing, you can tell a human interest plus sports. So you kind of get more people there, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than just a sports movie. There's uh, something about the mono e mono kind of uh, boxing situation that I think is, is, is it's easy to tell a good story, mm-hmm. uh, underdog and, story. And you have the space the world. to you have the space yeah. to tell the hero side and the villain side. If if you want to, you have the space to tell you know the hero's tragic backstory if you need to. There, there's I think there's a lot more space in a boxing movie than other types of sports movies. Yeah, but I, I agree right. that there's there's a lot of boxing movies. There are, and they're they're very 
similar. And I, I was, I just finished watching Creed and Creed two. And I'm like, I was reading through the IMDB and, uh, you know, Sylvester Stallone said he's walking away from the Rocky franchise. He's not going to do it anymore. He's handed over Michael B. Jordan. And I'm just like, where else can they go? What, what other story can they tell with Creed now at this point? He's, he's done the Drago fight. He's done the, you know, from humble beginnings. He's done the, I'm too good and I need to be brought down a peg. I think they've Mm -hmm. done everything in his two movies that they did in Rocky's first four. Yep. So. It'll be interesting be curious to see, to see what goes. they do. Maybe yeah. his maybe his wife will box in this next movie. Oh, that'd be good. Deaf, <laughs> deaf wife boxing. Uh, that'll be interesting. Maybe he can train his kid. I don't know. That's something <laughs> Rocky never actually did. Uh, so back to Cinema Sins is, and you were talking about you kind of take the hat on, take the hat off. I'm sure you get a lot of criticism about you know what is Cinema Sins? Is it an actual film critique? Are you guys just trying to be funny, or does it fall somewhere in the middle? What is your outlook on that? Um, uh, that's a good question, and because it, it, because truly it is it is all of that, right? It's right. Uh, there are some actual film critiques in our sins videos, um, but there's also a lot of stupid jokes. There's a lot of intentionally ignorant stuff. Um, we make we make actual mistakes sometimes when we're making these videos. Um, so it really is all of it, um, rolled up into one, you know, on, on, my, my instinct is to say, you know, we're not, don't take us seriously. Um, if, if you're in film school, don't watch our videos <laughs> thinking it's going to help you make better movies. I, I would never encourage that. Uh, no, just if, because if you went out to try and make a movie that had no sins, you, it would be a very bad movie. I feel it like. would be a very bad movie. Yeah. And, and, you know, I get that people are very binary, right? We want to put a label on things. And uh, I think that's what frustrates people who hate our content is that our content doesn't want to be put in a box. It doesn't want to be just film commentary. It doesn't want to just be humor. It doesn't, it wants to be all of that at once. And, uh, you know, I guess the best way to explain it as I'm rambling uh, is we're playing a character, right? We used to, we pitched it to each other as the Simpsons comic book nerd, um, the okay. guy who owns the comic store and, and knows the worst episode ever. Um, what if that guy started a YouTube channel about movies? Um, I feel like everybody has a friend who thinks they know everything. And that friend sometimes does know more than other people but often they're talking out of their ass and uh, this is that guy he lives in the basement of his parents house he thinks he's right about everything he says regarding movies he has no room for anyone else's opinion and sometimes he's right and sometimes he's wrong and sometimes he rambles um but uh this is not a real person (laughs) yeah (laughs) and these are not our real opinions no, and you can you can tell that that you guys uh, watching movies and sending movies there, there's a real love for movies there and and that you all actually enjoy watching them. That doesn't mean that you can't point out flaws and cliches while you're watching them because, like you said, they they all follow a pattern, yeah. and that that's what makes movies enjoyable because we go and it's comfortable. If if every movie was completely different and there were no patterns, we would never be comfortable just sitting and watching a movie. Mm. There there might be some enjoyable ones. But I, I don't I don't think it, it would be you'd be able to kind of just settle in as movies are supposed to be a passive hobby. You're just supposed to kind of let it happen to you. And, you know, it, I think for me, um, watching movies, it, it makes it more fun to kind of have that little ding go off when I see one of those cliches or, or those things that pops up. I have that little ding go off in my head. And whenever I watch a movie for the first time, the first thing I usually do after the movie's over is go to CinemaSins and see if you guys did a video on it yeah, <laughs> and then kind of see if, if your dings match all the dings that I found. <laughs> and uh, you, usually you're, you're much more, uh, you, you cover it a lot better than I do. You, you find a lot more sins than I ever do. Uh, well, it's, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm professional at it. Yeah, this is exactly. my job. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's talk about the actual sins to you in your mind, which are the most detrimental sins that a movie can commit and, and how do those hurt movies? Um, well, the biggest sin for me, and we phrase it different ways, but is, is when the movie breaks its own rules, um, 
you don't have to you don't have to tell me rules, right? You could mm-hmm. be the Fast and Furious and just let your characters be superheroes and never explain gravity if you want. Um, but when a movie says this is this is these are the rules, this is the the ghosts can see the humans, but the humans can't see the ghosts. But then it breaks that rule for a jump scare. Uh, that's the biggest sin, uh, in my opinion, um, because you, you're the creator. You're 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 the movie. The movie doesn't have to make any rules if it doesn't want to follow them. But once it does, you got to follow them. Um, so that'll pull me out of a movie faster than anything. Um, <clears throat> but um, you know, let's see. What are some other detrimental sins? Um, I don't know about detrimental. I think that's probably the most detrimental because. Yeah, and I, I get that. Um, you know, there's a lot of harmless sins that movies make all the time, like the, the pronoun game where mm-hmm. somebody says, I've got to tell her. The other character says, who? Just so that the first character can then have a reveal of the name. People don't talk like that in real life. Uh, they just say, I got to tell Susie. Um, but that's not detrimental to a movie. That's not going to take a movie off the rails or keep me from enjoying it. Um, generally, it's just that whole follow follow your own rules, especially if there are superpowers. This is why some of the Marvel stuff gets frustrating for me because I don't know who's stronger than who. Um, well, no, it, it seems to fluctuate between movies too. Yeah, it does. And so I just, I just need to know what the rules are and then see them followed. Um, uh, that's, that's the, the biggest sin a movie can commit. I think is not doing that. That's completely understandable. And I agree with you. If you, if you set up those rules, keep going with them. If, you know, if otherwise don't, like you said, Fast and Furious is a great example of, of movies that just don't care. Yeah, they, they don't care what your rules are. They don't care what the rules of the actual world are. They want to make something that's fun and entertaining. And for the most part, they do it. Yeah. Uh, how many times do you watch a movie before you sin it or before you write the sins? That has changed over the years. Uh, there are there are now six of us uh, at Team Sins. Uh, and we don't all write for every episode. So Mm -hmm. uh, some of the load is taken off by having other writers. So don't feel quite so stressed to catch everything myself because Chris or Aaron, somebody else might catch something I missed in the beginning when it was just me and Chris, I watched Les Mis six times. um, And I hate Les Mis. Um, And Mostly I had to watch it over and over because so much of the dialogue is singing in that movie and it's not easy to catch. Uh, these days I probably only watch a movie once or twice when I'm sinning it. Um, but that includes a lot of stopping and scrubbing back right. and rewatching scenes. Um, but it, we've refined our process over the years. We've added some extra writers. Um, but in the beginning, man, I would watch it three, four times on average. Yeah, that I, I would think that would be kind of the level you'd need to be at to catch everything. And it makes sense with six people to that, that you don't have to watch it three or four times anymore, that you watch it once, another person watches it once, another person watches it once. You can that three or four times is now spread out across three or four people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what is your favorite sin to give out? Ooh, this changes all the time, I'll be <laughs> honest. Um I'm gonna give you two. All right. Um there's one in one of the Resident Evil movies, which I'll be honest, they all run together for me. I don't know which one is which. Um, but uh, there's a scene where um, oh, I'm blanking on her name. Um, Mila Jovovich? Yes, Mila Jovovich rides a motorcycle through a stained glass window into a church to save people who are in the church from the zombies. And Chris wrote something along the lines of, because we do a lot of deus ex machina sins, mm-hmm. like the God from the machine. And he wrote, this is the, like deus ex machina on a literal machine <laughs> into a church. I forget his exact wording, but it was one of the best sins he ever wrote. Uh, but lately I've been laughing a lot about um, when we did Nas- National Treasure 2. Um, there's a scene in there where Randy Travis is in there. It's okay. like at a a party at the president's estate or something. Yeah, I haven't seen uh, National Treasure 2 in quite some time. It's yeah, not, well, you know, should you? <laughs> <laughs> um, and this was the first time we ever did this. We've done this several times since, but he looked old and ragged and I almost didn't recognize him. So the sin we wrote was like, we started writing a discount Randy Travis, like that guy looks like Randy Travis, but then halfway through the sin, the narrator realizes it's actually him. 
<laughs> so it comes out discount Randy. Holy shit. And, um, it just, those make me giggle every single time. I don't know why, uh, but you asked me tomorrow. I'll have two different sins to get the answer. Yeah. For. <laughs> I always enjoy, uh, the roll credits just mm. because it's, it's so egregious most of the time when it happens in a movie. Yep. And that's when the, the character says the name of the movie within the movie. And, you know, that was something I always noticed before I started watching Cinema Sins. And the, just like giving it that name recognition made it a lot more fun to catch. It's fun to me um, to realize how many people have been doing their own joke of that kind of moment in movies. Like before I was even out of high school, I read that Penn and Teller used to do like a movie club in New York with friends, famous people. Mm -hmm. And whenever the movie would say the title, they would all stand up and do a, do a standing ovation real briefly <laughs> and then sit back down. That was their version of the roll credits joke. Um, but it, uh, people have probably been joking about title drops in movies, uh, I guess, as long as there have been movies. Yeah, uh, I know Family Guy did a good one, too. Uh, where I think Peter's like sitting in a movie at one point and they, they say the name of the movie. And he goes, ha ha, they said the name of the movie and they like gets up and walks out. <laughs> Uh, so is it more difficult to sin films that you actually enjoy or is it easier because you can you, you have a love for them? So it's it makes more sense. Uh, it's easier, man, because um, and I honestly don't even think it's about my love for the movie. It's just how many times I've seen it. Um, so you know, when we did The Matrix, I had seen that movie 50 times. Uh, so it's very easy for me to tune out the plot and any of the flashing lights and Kung Fu and look for nitpicky things in the background. It's also easier. Sometimes I'll be able to write sins before I even start watching the movie because I know the movie so well. Right. I'll be like, Oh, I'm definitely going to send this part. I'm going to send this part. Um, <clears throat> well, what about one you it, haven't seen a million times? Like when Parasite came out, you said that was something that really surprised you and you really enjoyed. Is that's that's a good point, and that's more difficult, um, you know, because I can enjoy a movie I've only seen once or twice, but, and I don't have that familiarity yet, um, and so I'm more likely to get sucked into just enjoying the movie than I am to continue writing my sins. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but when you give me a terrible movie, when you give me the fourth transformers movie that's the slog man I'm, yeah i start out hating that and i have to watch two and a half hours of it um Plus yeah transformers it's much movies, easier getting longer well yeah seriously so what was the in your mind what's the hardest movie you've had to sin uh either because it's too good or because it's too hard to sit through or, or both um well i'm gonna go with the original pete's dragon um, this is a fairly famous sins video amongst our fans because of how angry I got, um, watching it. I had never seen it. Uh, and we were sending it, um, in, uh, in order to time it with the, the remake that was coming out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that movie's bad. It's so bad. It's I've never seen it, it either. So I, I probably haven't seen the sins video on it. Cause I usually don't watch them for movies I haven't seen. It's, it's irredeemably bad. Um, and, you know, it, it resulted in a lot of humor. I was able to take that anger at the movie and, and put it into my writing. Uh, I started breaking character, calling out Chris for scheduling this movie. And um, it's probably the, the angriest I've ever gotten in real life. And, uh, you know, as the, as the narrator of cinema sins, it's just a slog. It's not even a long movie, uh, but those are the, those are always the hardest is, is when it's just, there's no, there's nothing redeemable. There's, nothing, yeah. there's no good. You can't find anything to cling to and you just have to keep going through the mess. It's the worst. I'll have to check out that video. I remember we did try and watch it one time with my kids. It's probably two years ago. Uh, and we made it about 15 minutes before they were like, ah, oh, it's so wow. bad. I hate it. I hate it so much. So let's, shift kind of into movies and you know what where the movie industry is and where it's going uh, because i think we're actually at a very interesting time to have this conversation because it's mm -hmm. it's very in flux right now but uh before that what are your favorite movies to like the favorite types of movies favorite genres to watch and then conversely which ones are your favorite to sin 
Ooh, I am a, a sucker for a good high concept sci-fi movie, man. Um, they they don't even have to hit the mark. Um, like Something the Matrix like High Life. Does. Yeah, or um, that Justin Timberlake movie In Time. Um, oh yeah. I love watching that movie. It's not that's, good. That's a fun movie. Yeah, it's, it's but not it's, good. It's got such a great concept. Uh, what if what if time were money? Uh, mm-hmm. And you know, a lot of the best high concept movies come from Philip K. Dick stories or what have you. But um, yeah, that Ben Affleck movie Paycheck. Um, I don't think I've ever which seen I think that. is also based on Philip K. Dick. Um, <clears throat> so that's probably my favorite genre to watch uh, because sci-fi opens up so many possibilities uh storytelling humanity space um time travel you just there's so much that you can do um and then my favorite genre to sin is probably we haven't done a ton of this but i'm gonna go with old school classic disney animation oh um interesting when we did the original cinderella I had a blast. I had so much fun. And that movie's bonkers. That movie spends way more time on mice than you ever remember. Oh yeah. Um but uh and then we did a we did an event here in Nashville where we had maybe 50 or so fans that had come where we watched uh I want to say what's the other one? Sleeping Beauty. Um and we just kind of had mics and we just kind of live riffed while that movie was on, that's another movie that's absolutely bonkers. Yeah, Sleeping um, Beauty is a, a rough one, and uh, my my daughters they went through a a phase where Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty were the favorites, and and the, the, those were on the TV a lot. Yeah, and it's just something about those th- that era of movies um, that you know they weren't they weren't even really going for realism at all. But uh, I don't know, I just had so much fun. Uh, I would love to dive back into all of those and, and cinema. I mean, Disney Plus is right there. You got all the access you need. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, for me, I, I'm. I, in the past, I've I've been a big fan of comedies, but I I don't know if it's just there haven't been that many good comedies to watch anymore. Um, and I like that you guys don't usually sin comedies because they're so outrageous to begin with. The, the yeah. Point of the point of sinning them kind of wears off right away. Um, but I, I agree with the, the kind of high sci-fi or, or um, I, I'm more on the fantasy side of it. If, if you give me somewhat of a magical world, I'm, mm. I'm always going to be there for it. Mm. And uh, I, I like watching I like watching the sins on the, the movies I like. I, I really enjoyed watching sins on Tenet and, you know, Tenet still baffles me no matter how many times I'll watch it. Uh, but it, it's interesting and it's a good yeah. movie. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I did. I liked on the, the Tenet Sins, and it took me way too long to notice this, that when John David Washington reversed, you guys reversed the counting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which was a really cool, like, little Easter egg. And I, uh, it took me probably three minutes uh, to notice. I'm like, are they taking Sins away for everything right now? And then I'm like, oh, I get it. I get it. That's probably, if if, if I could show you the script, that's probably the wildest looking script for any Sins <laughs> sure. video with all the notations and colors and lines. And it was, it was bonkers to put together. What was the one that broke the Sins counter? Uh, the, the video you mean? It was yeah. one, of the, one of the Transformers I ones. I think so, yeah. Uh, maybe Fast and Furious. <laughs> Honestly, those Fast and Furious and Transformers movies might as well be the same thing to me. Um, but it was one of, I, it might have been Fast and Furious actually. Might have been that eighth Fast and Furious. Yeah, could be. Because Chris came in narrating, and he was like, "It's bad. You killed it. It's bad." <laughs> I so I enjoy the Fast and Furious movies more so than the Transformers. Uh, after like, actually, the first Transformers is the only one that I I would enjoy and you know make myself sit through again. But I can watch the Fast and Furious because I I think they understand what they are a little bit better. Yeah. Whereas oh, yeah. Transformers, like I said, they they keep making them longer and longer, and then they bring in Mark Wahlberg and I don't think your franchise is ever doing good when your your next big step is to bring in Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, well, I completely agree with that statement. Which he, he's fine in things, but if this is your okay, we're coming back with a bang, and it's Mark Wahlberg and dinosaur transforming monster or robots, uh, it, it's not going to work. 
And <laughs> I, I just I think Fast and Furious does a better job of just keeping rolling. They they keep it right at two hours most of the time. They they know they're outrageous. They lean into the outrageousness of it. Whereas Transformers tries to be this like thought provoking thing that just doesn't exist within it. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Uh, so let's try and leave the pandemic year out of this next talking point for a minute. How have you seen the movie industry change over the past, you know, 10, 15, 20 years outside of the pandemic? Cause the pandemic has kind of made it things make a jump forward. That was a little unexpected, but the industry was changing before that. I, um, uh, I mean the biggest from my, from my perspective, I can't speak to the entire industry, but it has right. been the transition from film to, to digital, um, okay. because I, uh, I'm one of these guys that spent so much time building movies and splicing prints that I see it as an art form. Um, and, uh, Chris and I both took a great deal of pride in threading up a projector and providing an excellent presentation for customers. Um, we didn't like it if the sound was off or the focus was off or what have you. Um, and you know, now those, those kind of theaters are essentially gone. Mm -hmm. You still have them in pockets, but it's mostly your, your indie theaters, your art house places, all the cineplexes have gone full digital, um, <clears throat> which, you know, is a, is a big win for the studios and not as much for the theaters. So theaters can save a little bit of money, um, I guess on staffing, but uh, the studios don't have to ship physical prints all around mm -hmm. the country anymore. Um, used to be, you know, when we worked at a 27 screen theater. Uh, so Thursday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, we'd get maybe 15, 20 cans, film cans delivered from two different companies. And then those would all have to be built and turned in, into actual movies people could watch. Um, and so uh, they They've completely changed all of that now. It's all satellite uh, distributed. Um, <clears throat> and it, it, a little bit of the magic is gone, I think, for me. Uh, I'm going to show my age, but I miss the noise on the print. I miss the scratches and the cigarette burns and all the little ticks yeah. that come along with an actual physical film going through a projector. Um, you know, it's certainly a better presentation overall. Um, certainly better for the industry uh, in all ways. It's just, it's sad for me that something that I spent so much time perfecting and doing well and taking pride in is just gone. It's just not done anymore. Right. Um, but uh, <clears throat> you're probably not even asking about film versus digital. You're probably asking. <laughs> well, I never thought about, about it that way. Uh but that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I'm thinking as you're talking kind of, you know, waxing, waxing nostalgic on it, I'm thinking of uh, one of my first favorite movies, the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie from 1990, obviously. And watching that on VHS versus like now I go watch it on Blu-ray of kind of those imperfections that you fell in love with that that made the movie feel more real. And I mean, it's about giant turtles who fight crime with karate, but it. And and I get like VHS is definitely not the same thing as film and a projector and all of that, but it I I can kind of see where you're coming from of of the work you put into you know building those reels out and and making that movie a whole thing out of these you know six disparate canisters that now you have to put together yeah uh, and and it you know it's it's weird that that both things have existed within thirty years and that uh. You know that it jumped that quickly. It was like, no, we're going to do it this this easy way, and screw all these people who've spent their whole lives trying to work one way and and building, you know, building this knowledge base that just doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. I guess the biggest way the industry has changed outside of that would just be uh, in terms of uh, box office. So it's it's a global industry now. It's not just uh, domestic industry so a movie can open here like i think the most recent pirates the caribbean movie didn't do much in the u.s but it made so much money in china it doesn't matter right so now um, they can make a sixth and one. so they're making movies differently now because of that they're making movies for a global audience there's sometimes like iron man 3 had extra scenes in it 
in China that weren't in the American version, uh, which I think is a fascinating thread we could pull on for an entire other podcast. Yeah, about that's... how is it? How when is the movie a, a, a movie if it's uh, different for two different audiences? Uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> so yeah, when the studios are looking at the returns, they're they're no longer just looking at. Uh, the domestic take or even looking at the domestic take first uh, they're looking at the global take and that will and has uh, and will continue to change the content of the movies um, and i think it's for the better i i think it can be um but it's also something that's led to nine fast and furious movies so far 10th one coming soon it's it's led to this many transformers it's led to pirates of the caribbean i i think representation and you know making movies for a more global audience is a good thing and an important thing but when it's just we're going to turn out this franchise crap because people yeah. pay to see it yeah i don't or people in china pay to see it then i don't i don't know that that's necessarily a good thing and that that was kind of my thought when when thinking of this talking point was that the franchiseization of movies of everything has to be a franchise you know the death of the mid-budget film doesn't exist yeah. anymore uh, my wife and I constantly have this argument. She thinks there aren't, you know, there's no longer any good movies made. Everything's CGI fest or, you know, this indie darling. And it's impossible to find anything in the middle because no one's making Forrest Gump or the Shawshank Redemption anymore. Mm. Those things, they've gone to TV screens, right? Those are now prestige dramas on HBO or on Netflix or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And um, the the funny thing about it is, you know, she'll bring up everything that gets released in a theater and that you'd want to go see. It's one of the big three kind of to steal from the Falcon and the Winter Soldier uh, recently. It's aliens, androids or wizards. Those those are what people go pay money for, uh, for whatever reason. And she doesn't she doesn't like those types of movies because they've saturated the market at this point. Every movie that that looks like it's going to be a big release is one of those things. And yeah. uh, her argument to make this point was like, well, they don't make Jaws anymore. They don't make Alien anymore. They don't make Terminator anymore, which is true. But those also all fall kind of in the, you know, Jaws is a monster, but everything else falls in those big three. And it's just they don't they don't make them at a lower budget anymore. They they throw 50 million into it and get as many good actors as they can, as much CGI as they can. And I think at the time, those three movies, which are, you know, some of the greatest releases ever were out of the norm. Every, everything was this kind of slow-moving Godfather-type movie, and then those kind of broke the mold. But now the the mold is those movies, so it's every single movie. So you have to do something completely different to break the mold, and usually now those are low-budget indie movies, which there's a lot of good there. They're just hard to find. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got to work for it. Yeah, and uh, I you know, I try and tell her, I'm like, there's, there's good movies. We can watch this, we can watch this. She's like, I've never even heard of it. I'm like, well, I know. <laughs> You got to trust me at some point. <laughs> uh, so do you think the franchisization and, uh, you know, going to a global market, you kind of said that that is looking better for an industry in, in what ways can those things help the movie industry? Well, I just think from a philosophical standpoint, the idea of making movies for a more diverse population is is good mm -hmm. um you know where as you said where it where that strategy doesn't work is when the studios go you know, throw a bunch of transformers movies at us because they do really well overseas um but you know you get i also think it led directly to something like parasite which we talked about before which won best picture uh as a foreign language film um which is historic. Um, and I can't help but wonder if the globalization of film isn't working both ways, right? Where mm -hmm. um, Americans are now getting exposed or maybe will get exposed to more diverse types of films um, <clears throat> as, as film goes more global. Um, <clears throat> But the franchise stuff is the, is the worst, man. If you know yeah. anything about me, you know, I can't stand unnecessary sequels. Uh, some stories cry for a sequel. I'm not going to say they don't. But these days, everything gets a sequel. Everything. Yeah. So the, 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 when I knew it had changed for the worse was when Hangover got three movies. Yeah, that was that was a terrible idea. Comedy sequels never worked to begin with. And Agreed. 
it, it just like if you like these people, put them in a different movie. Think of a new idea. It, it, both Hangover One or Hangover Two and Hangover Three were literally rehashings of Hangover One. Oh, that, that's you so can't, bad. I don't know why you make that sequel. Like, why why are you making the exact same movie, especially now when you know movies movies are going digital at that point. Everybody can very easily own whatever movies they want. I would much rather just watch The Hangover again than watch The Hangover 2 or The Hangover 3. Yeah, yeah. It's just money, man. It's just, I oh, mean, yeah. the studios are, are always going to chase money over artistic quality. <laughs> if they can have both, that's great. You know, they love to crow about having a best picture on their roster. But what they really want at the end of the day is the dollars. And, you know, that's why we get this. That's why. That's why we're seeing so many reunion shows mm-hmm. that started with Netflix and the Fuller House garbage. But now, like, Disney is doing it uh, with the Mighty Ducks Mighty show. Ducks, yeah. And it's it's all about who, what, what properties do we own the rights to that we don't have to pay extra for? Let's make that and put it on our streaming service. Um, let's, let's pay everybody, you know, a million each to come back, sit in a room <laughs> for a couple hours, and boom. Yeah, you know, and no, you know, right. I, I get it. The Americans are simple people. They, if they have nostalgia for something, they'll go back to the reunion or the reboot or the sequel or what have you. And I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't make sense from a dollar standpoint. It does. It's just, uh, you know, from a creative standpoint, from somebody who, you know, I'm somebody who writes books. I write my own stories. Like I'm not mm-hmm. saying they're awesome. But every time I see something like well, Indecent Proposal 2 or what have that's not real, yeah. by the way. Um, I die a little inside. It probably is. <laughs> There's people out there like me who are writing original stories and they're just they're not getting as much of a shot um, right. right now because everybody's trying to develop IP they already own. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I've rambled enough on that, I now, guess. I, like Seinfeld is one of my all time favorite shows. I watch it pretty much every night. Um, I, I could quote any line from any episode ever probably. And, you know, we, I had a conversation with somebody a couple day, a couple weeks ago asking if I'd want to see a Seinfeld reunion. I'm just like, no, like th- there's no way they can bring it back. Like I can, I can watch Seinfeld whenever I want. Uh, the thing Larry David did on curb was pretty good. Um, where they did an episode within an episode kind of thing. And that's all I need. I don't, I don't want to live with those people where they are in 2020 because I don't know that it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't get it either. They're, they're doing a friend's reunion too. And I, it, it just doesn't make sense. No, um, I mean, and again, that's HBO max and Warner brothers is oh, they yeah, own the gonna, rights to friends. And so they're like, well, this will get people to watch. Right. They're, so they're, they're only doubling reason- down on everything. Like even in the, the space jam trailer, we see every piece of IP, you know, lining up around the basketball court to watch LeBron play. And it's like, what, that, why is that yeah, necessary? That's why we got um, Snyder's justice league cut is hmm. that they already owned it. They already own the IP. We pay out 70 million and we'll make more than that back in subscribers on HBO Max. I mean, in an era before the streaming wars, uh, that movie never gets released, ever. Um, so it's a brand new ball game. So what do you think, we talked a lot about bad sequels, what do you think makes an actual good sequel? When do those come across? Good sequels. Well. Out of the like six of them that exist. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot. All right. Um, uh, a surprisingly good sequel is Psycho uh, Two, um, okay. which has Anthony Perkins that. in it. Um, I am a, I'm a sucker for the Bourne movies, and I have always claimed that Ultimatum the Third was the best of the bunch um, because I feel like by that point, well, they just do so much cool shit in that mm-hmm. movie. Um, it's they've already established the characters, so we don't need quite as much. Um, I guess character development. Um, we can just let him be awesome. Um, it's it's really rare, and I I think in general, not every story needs to be extended. Uh, Aliens is probably a classic example. Um, where James Cameron came in and said, "Okay, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what Ridley Scott did. Instead of a tense, intimate, 
suspense film. I'm going to make this huge machine gun action film uh, set in the same universe. That one really works. Um, the but, Terminator kind of did the same thing. You know, Terminator, the first Terminator is basically a stalker movie. And then Terminator 2 is now it's an action movie. And, yeah, and it's yeah. A chase, that's another great you know. example. Also, James Cameron, ironically mm-hmm. enough. He hasn't come out with Titanic 2 yet, though. <laughs> and Thank I'm expecting, God. He, and I'm he will eventually. 19 Avatar sequels are not going to be that, that – not going to have that no. much new and interesting things to say. He um, is – chasing a delusion i think with these avatar sequels but i don't think he's actually doing anything he's just really you think up. he's just yeah. twiddling his thumbs the studio just keeps giving him money he's like yeah we're, we're <laughs> filming underwater man don't worry about it <laughs> yeah it i think a sequel has to add in some meaningful way whether it's character development or you have to do something different if you come out here and you just rehash the same exact plot what's the point what are you doing it's like a it's like a cover song right mm-hmm. a, good, a good cover song shouldn't sound exactly like the original you should add your own thing to it when you cover a song to make it something new that's what a sequel needs to do you take the inspiration from the original but you tweak something important and give us a different film yeah and we're getting a lot of what i like to call clickbait sequels now is that people (laughs) like the first movie uh that it was never planned to have a sequel and now because people liked it we're just going to keep adding on to it knives out is a great example of that knives out good movie Great standalone, doesn't need anything else. We don't need to extend that story any, but now we're getting a sequel and maybe like three sequels on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. Just, and just I, like why? I don't I also don't understand why they're gonna call it knives out two or knives out anything. The knives yeah. were about the family in the first movie who had the big wall of knives. It's the second mystery, whatever you do with the second murder, it's not gonna have anything to do with knives. So why are you calling it knives out? Because the the next ones they'll just follow the Daniel Craig character. I'm assuming we're not going back to this whole family. I right. Hope. No. That in fact I think I read that uh, that's exactly what they're doing. He's going to be in another part of the world solving a different murder. So I'm just and like you're only calling okay. it. You know yeah. that that might be okay because you can tell a, you can tell a different story and you just have this one character back rather than well, let's go yeah. back now. So now uh you know what's her name from Halloween. Oh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Jamie Lee, yeah, you're not going back to this family saying Jamie Lee Curtis has died now. Let's figure out what happened to her. That would be a problem. I agree. I agree. And I kind of I like Ryan Johnson. I think he'll put some effort into it, other than you know some of these other ones like Transformers or Fast and Furious, where they just keep churning them out. But I don't I don't think it's necessary in any way. No, uh, I agree. So what are some upcoming CinemaSins videos that you can talk about that you're anticipating? Ooh, ooh. Uh, let's see what I can talk about here. All right. Well, I'll talk about I'll 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 talk about one um, that I just finished writing that won't be out for months, so people will probably forget about it. Uh, nice. But in honor of uh, this year's U.S. Open golf tournament, we have decided to send Happy Gilmore. Oh, that'll be a good um, one. And I'm a sucker for early Adam Sandler stuff. Um, the more absurdist, Happy Gilmore, Billy Madison. That, yeah. That's my favorite Adam Sandler. Um, and I've seen I've seen Happy Gilmore plenty of time, but putting on the sin hat for that movie, <laughs> and I'm a golfer myself, um, and that movie doesn't know crap about golf. <laughs> not at all. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a golfer at all, and I can tell that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the fans being able to see that one. That'll, that'll be really good. I'm excited for that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Sin spinoffs. Uh, you guys have a lot of other channels. What are those and kind of what went into the development of each one? Why did you think this is a good idea to do this too? Um, yeah, so Music Video Sins um, was the – well, actually, if we're being honest, we did uh, – we dabbled in a, a thing called Brand Sins as well. I remember Brand Sins. Uh, which, which, for anyone who wants to know, we – do not own that channel anymore. I have no idea what they're doing, if anything. <laughs> um, but we did not, that didn't really fit into our, the tone of our brand. And so we divested of that channel. Um, that was years ago. Uh, so Music Video Sins started out uh, seeming perfect to us because of how absurd music videos are. Of course, we we stupidly, thought about music videos from our our childhood like take on me by um aha and november rain um and 
we started out sending a bunch of like 80s and 90s ridiculous music videos, which was fine. We that channel grew an audience pretty quick, but uh, over time we've learned that they want they want the new stuff. They want the latest Lil Nas X video or the latest BTS video. Um, and the older stuff doesn't really move the needle, um, mm-hmm. which has been interesting. Um, and then we launched TV Sins after that, which is mostly run by Aaron Dicer and Jonathan Watkins and Danae Hughes, the, our three employees. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that channel is still steadily growing. And the TV was hard to get our head around for a while because um, we felt like if we're going to send something like Breaking Bad, we have to do the whole thing. And where do we find the time for that? And finally we just realized you know we can probably go an episode at a time people who really know the shows will will understand that and you know over time maybe we will send all of breaking bad but we'll do it an episode at a time yeah i like i like how you kind of jump around between shows on tv sins as well it's not you know you didn't do six seasons of breaking bad one after the other you do a couple of breaking bad and then you move over to game of thrones and then you know you'll throw a wandavision in there because that's what's doing hot you know uh i to me, I, I kind of like that because that's how I watch TV. You know, I'm not just watching six seasons of th- something at one time. I'm watching Breaking Bad. I'm watching uh, yep. This Is Us or, you know, whatever's on TV. So I, I think it makes sense to kind of do it that way. You'll throw in like a Simpsons or a Rick and Morty every once in a while. And I, it's I, I I enjoy most the Big Bang Theory ones because I watched I just I watched all 12 seasons. The last seven are awful. Uh, I wouldn't put it on anyone. And it, it it's fun to relive those because I'll never go back and rewatch the show. So it's kind of fun to relive those through sending them. Yeah. Like, then that, come up. that channel is really data driven more than any of our channels. Um, so we look at, you know, what what videos we've made so far that move the needle and you know, our predictions on which shows people want to see sinned have consistently been wrong. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the the what we call insta sinning uh, has worked really well. We did it with the WandaVision where the crew gets up a sins video for the latest episode within a few days after it airs. Um, and those have been extremely popular. Uh, so I think you can look for those to continue. Um and then just a few months ago, we launched uh, Commercial Sins, which is television commercials, which are even more absurd than music videos. Um, and those are really fun because uh, you can write an episode in 10 minutes, um, little bite-sized versions of Sins videos that are two minutes long instead of 15. Um, and uh, that is it. We've got, we've got four official sanctioned Sins channels out there right now. And I would guess it'd be a couple of years before we put any other new channels out just because we have to see the growth and see mm-hmm. what's working and what's not. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I The idea behind commercial sense, it kind of goes, you kind of get to get back to brand sense a little bit there too, is you can, you can mix some of those jokes that you'd have for Pepsi into a Pepsi commercial now. Yes, yes, and, exactly. Yeah, so that works. Uh, how do you feel there are some knockoff sins channels out there? I've seen... What have I seen? I've seen everything great about XYZ mm. movie. I have seen uh, somebody who goes and sins your sinning of the the movies. Mm. Uh, so what do you feel about things like that? Have you seen any of those? Talk about um, the one that I like the most. Uh, the, the one that I uh, I just think is funny is the there's a guy who does sins videos for the My Little Pony show okay um and he calls it cinemare sins um because a mare is a horse yeah. and um he actually reached out pretty early on and asked me on twitter if that was cool if he did that um and of course we didn't have tv sins at the time but i was like man we're never going to send those go for it have fun it's such a niche yeah um and he still makes them he's i follow him on twitter he's still makes those videos and loves everything about the ponies and There's i'm a right lot of my that. little pony out there so you know yeah, that, there is. Never, um, for the people who like it that'll never get stale i just think in general it speaks to it's hard for me to get riled up in either emotional direction i just think it it's a sign that we're succeeding we're doing well mm-hmm. if there are channels that are either making fun of us or 
uh, riffing on our style uh, motif. It's just, I try to view that as a sign that we must be doing something right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so let's talk about mental health and why it's important and, and why we should see it in you know, the, the media we consume. In, in your mind, why is it important to advocate for mental health awareness in storytelling? Um, because there are millions of sleeping cases of anxiety and mental health issues in America that have not been diagnosed. Um, um, <clears throat> I think that's why uh, we have to continue to destigmatize the idea of therapy. You know, for years, even even recently, um, going to a shrink is the butt of a joke in a movie. Um, like Entourage played all the therapy sessions with Ari and his wife for laughs. There was no good therapy in that show. <laughs> um, right. And, you know, for me, this was my journey. I didn't know anything about mental health. I just had five nights in a row where I couldn't sleep and my chest was pounding and I thought I was going to have a heart attack. So I went to the doctor and I'm rattling off all these things I'm experiencing. And she smiles, and says, well, you have anxiety. And I was like, Are you t I'm telling you, my, my chest is pounding. I might think I have a heart problem. She's like, you're a textbook case of anxiety. Um, and it took a couple medications to find the right one for me. But once we found the right one for me, the difference is so palpable. And as I go through therapy, um, talking about my life and my past, I can I start to see these areas in my youth and in college where I was very anxious and it was manifesting in these various ways, but I was undiagnosed. I didn't know that therapy or medication could have helped me. I didn't even know I had anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just seen too many people close to me go through the same journey. So I know, I know there are millions out there, especially during a pandemic oh, yeah. who are wrestling with anxiety and don't know it. Um, cause it can manifest. It does not just always chest pounding. Sometimes it's you extra distracted. Sometimes you're lethargic. Sometimes you, you have trouble focusing. Sometimes you're irritable. Um, and I think people just chalk it up to mood swings or external factors. So it's very important to me to be an advocate for mental health. Um, you know, the, if you do continue reading the Abel's books, you, when you get to the third one, I would say 25% of that book is him in therapy. Um, mental health therapy sessions, grappling with um, what being an actual teenage superhero would do to someone's mind. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then we talk about it on our podcast all the time. My co-host Barrett um, is uh, has years of experience on the clinical side of mental health. Um, and uh, we have a longstanding partnership with uh, BetterHelp, which is a uh, mental health online with licensed therapists. I just, every, every place that I'm able, uh, I want to make mention of that because uh, we occasionally get messages from people who say, Hey, after all your harping on it, I finally went to therapy or I finally got some medication and it made a world of difference. And I'm telling you right now, that means more to me than however many millions of views the videos get. Um, you know, I'm glad that we entertain people and make them laugh, uh, but I feel like a good human being when I get somebody into therapy. Yeah, that's really important. And I think a lot of it comes down to representation in, you know, the same way countless minority groups are asking for the same type of representation that people want to see themselves on the screen or, you know, hear themselves. And because with that comes an awareness. I, I think yep. you hit the head, the nail on the head when you said, you know, uh, mental health issues have been the butt of the joke for so long. And, you know, it's finally, I think we're, we're turning the corner on a little bit and we're becoming a little more woke and that or quote unquote woke. And that helps people who are struggling come to terms with their struggle and want to seek help or understanding. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, same way with you. I, you know, I've struggled with social anxiety my entire life, uh, but was kind of always just told, Oh, he's just shy. He doesn't, you know, he, he's not going to say anything that, that kind of stuff. Uh, but really in the last 10 years or so, I used to work at a uh, at a, a shelter for um, troubled youths. And mm. so there were counselors there that I wasn't actually seeing a counselor, but they kind of pointed out some of these indicators to me. 
Hmm. And and it, it was like a switch flipped in my head. And I could kind of go back through my past and, and see like, yep, that's anxiety, that's anxiety, that's anxiety. And, and it all started making sense to me. And you don't get a chance to see that. Like people can't come to that realization unless they meet someone who knows who they're talk what they're talking about or see some form of representation. And yep. there's not enough of that in the media we consume. And, you know, the instances that we do see it are still that they're still not all the way there yet, you know, but there are they're they're coming around. And, you know, there there have been things that I've watched uh, that that can help with coping mechanisms or help with acceptance, things like that. Even something, you know, that was as bad at portraying a lot of things as the Big Bang Theory there was some real good coping mechanisms that could be found by watching that, by watching mm. these people who are bad representations deal with their issues. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it helped me see that it's okay to have these problems. You know, people will still care about you and, and be around you, uh, but also not be a complete asshat like the characters on the show are uh, like there, there is, there's room for everything there. And yeah. uh, I yeah. think that's important. Uh, what are some of the better examples you've seen of the portrayal of of mental health and awareness in uh, movies or TV? Oh man. Um, okay, you have to you have to stay with me on this journey here. Um, I gotcha. The best that I've seen um, to date was the first season of Stars: The Girlfriend Experience. Now, this is okay. a very R-rated show. Um, it's about a, a a girl who starts being a call girl, essentially for ex exceedingly wealthy men. And she provides the girlfriend experience where she mm -hmm. spends the day with them and what have you. Um, and the show's fascinating for a number of reasons. I'm not trying to get anyone who's not into nudity to watch a show with a bunch <laughs> of nudity, but this girl, uh, Riley Keough is the actress of the okay. season one. And um, you know, this, lifestyle messes with her um and she has a panic attack in her law office where she works after somebody finds out what she does and it is the most accurate depiction of a of a panic attack i've ever seen um she looks like she's drowning um suffocating um body doubles over onto the ground um i've had panic attacks they're different for everybody but you know a lot of times movies uh <laughs> uh <clears throat> misunderstand what that is or go for a more cinematic sort of way to show someone's having mm -hmm. a panic attack um <clears throat> um but this it was powerful man it moved me uh it, it, i related to it and uh it made me anxious to watch it yeah uh, and it was really really well done uh there are plenty of examples and it's getting better um but that's the best one i've seen that's interesting uh i've, I've never seen the girlfriend experience uh i, I think indie movies more so than you know large budget movies do a good job of in their portrayal of mental health awareness just because mm -hmm. It's usually the main focus of an indie movie. If if they're making a movie about mental health, they make it about mental health. Whereas big budget movies, they'll just throw it in as you know a quirk or a half ass stab at representation. It's it's not all there always. Um, things like the perks of being a wallflower, where uh, mm. you know these you have all these kids that are dealing with their own stuff, but kind of find solace in each other, or it's kind of a funny story uh, does the same thing. Um, and, and that does an excellent job, I think, of showing how a lot of people are dealing with different shit and that there are several ways to cope with that. And um, and using those coping mechanisms and talking to other people who understand will help you get through it. And, and that, you know, these the things you're dealing with aren't necessarily the end of the world, even though you make them out to be in your head. A lot of people are doing that. And, and there's there's places to find solace. Um, I think both of those movies do kind of a good job of showing that uh, and not necessarily always, you know, you, you don't always have to have trauma behind the, uh, the mental health issues. Right. Because that, I think that's where a lot of movies go to is, well, this person has anxiety because X, Y, and Z happened to them in the past. Right. And, and that, that's not how it works. Right. I mean, it does sometimes, sure. but it, it's important to, to, to show other representations of how that can manifest. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what are some of the worst you've seen? Oh, well, I mentioned Entourage. Um, yeah. The, 
Bad Boys 2, I think. Okay. Um, it's really offensive. The Woosah. Yeah, they're making fun of, he's constantly being made fun of for his mantra. And there's even a scene when Will Smith goes to quote unquote therapy and it's just a sex scene. Yeah. Um, so that was one I remember seeing recently. Uh, Sopranos is actually really good, I think. Um, it was ahead of its time in terms of treating the therapy process as a process, right? And not mm-hmm. just uh, a scene where you can make a few jokes. Like like analyze this uh, Billy Crystal, Robert De Niro yeah. movie. It's really sort of tap dancing on mental health. Um uh, to be a right, to no try one wants to go a, fully into it. You know, you, yeah, you've got yeah, these big exactly. actors into it. We're not going fully into it because that we think that'll turn <clears throat> yeah. off viewers for whatever reason. I think Entourage is probably the worst for me um, uh, in modern content that I've seen, where it's just it's it's just a it's a scene where they get to make some jokes and let Ari be an let Ari asshole. Yell a little bit. Yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, I, I'm going to stand by the statement any day of the week. I, I think the Joker was one of the worst portrayals of people uh, with mental health issues. I, I, I went agree. on probably a 15 tweet long rant on Twitter a, after I watched the movie. And it just, it wanted to say that, you know, you don't always know what someone else is going through. So tread lightly, but really instead it said that anyone with a mental health issue is on the verge of a killing spree at any moment. Yes. And that's not a good way to portray, portray things, you know, no, it, it threw I'm... too many different things at the audience. And then it was just like, boom, mental health issues. got to watch out. And it's, uh... there's a good dozen reasons to hate yeah. that movie. If you ask me, I'm, yeah. I'm not a big fan. <laughs> uh, so how could movies in your mind do a better job of not only portraying mental health issues in a more realistic way, but then also kind of using their stories to advocate for better services and treatment? Because that's another place where, you know, the Joker almost hit the nail on the head with with the services are letting this guy down. Yes. Uh, but then they, they ran away from it too quickly. They uh, did. So that's another thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that, oh, well, this person is suffering from mental health issues. They just need to get help. Help's not always there. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And there's a, actually in Nashville about a year ago, we just uh, had a, a center open that's basically free mental health mm-hmm. care. If, or it's considered like emergent care. Like, so what they're trying to do is take uh, mental health cases that would used to get you tossed in the drunk tank at the jail and steer them towards actual help. Um, anyway, um you know, I think we're getting close. Now, the, the part that you said that I really like is the, you know, advocating for better services and treatment options. That's going to take longer. Yeah. But Marvel, interestingly, with WandaVision and with Falcon and Winter Soldier is definitely grappling with trauma uh, head on. Um, and I haven't seen every episode of both shows, but you know, WandaVision, essentially, the whole concept is this trauma that she's suffered uh, that has led to the creation of this town. Um, and, you know, Falcon and Winter Soldier seems to be leaning heavily into Bucky's, what is my identity? Uh, I've been through all of this trauma. How do I find a path to being a good person? I think all that's really good. Um, I, I would love to see it go more overt, man. I would love to mm-hmm. see a superhero in therapy, man, and yeah. not as a joke, not not the way Deadpool would do a therapy scene. Right. <laughs> um, or, well, the I mean, the they even, would. I think Iron Man three was the one where he's sitting there talking to Bruce Banner in the, the end credit scene where this is whole, they, they kind of made the joke out of the whole movie of Iron Man three was him dealing with his trauma, which it was. But then at the end they threw in the joke of, well, he's just sitting there telling the story to Banner. Yeah. Yeah. And Banner's not a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> So I, I think those Marvel shows are hinting that they may lean into that. And as, again, I, I wrote some superhero dealing with the trauma of their actions into my book. I think that's you know a place that I would love to see, especially now that superheroes are so front and center, right? This mm-hmm. is the era of superhero films. The MCU has made certain of that. Um, and so now those films need to represent everyone. And, and we're getting close to that, right? We're, we're, we're getting the Shang-Chi Mm-hmm. Just gonna bring the first Asian superhero to the MCU. Um, so I, I think there are people in charge there that that are trying to move toward representation as much as it's gonna frustrate those angry white guys out there in America. But <laughs> those old can, angry white guys. They can deal. Yeah. 
Uh, I, I agree. I think it just needs to be more, more real. You know, not everyone who suffers from a mental health issue is on the verge of killing themselves. Not everyone who tries to kill themselves has some abusive past or sexual trauma that, that leads into that. Um, you know, not everyone is going to have some big public cinematic freak out, like you said. Um, you know, the, the girlfriend experience does a good job, whereas a lot of movies, they, they try and make it this big deal where sometimes it's not like that. You're just alone in a room and you, the, the walls feel like you're cr- closing in on you. Yep. And I think it's important that they do a better job of showing that therapy is not bad or pointless or the enemy somehow. Like if you're going to therapy, you did something wrong. Um, and I thought on TV sins, uh, when they did the second episode of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, they did a great job of pointing this out. The therapist was never actually providing any therapy. She was mm. just there to dump exposition. Yeah. Um, and I think scenes like that make people not seek therapy because they see this and it's like, well, if that's how therapy works, it didn't do anything. They just walked out of the room and did the same thing they were doing anyways. Yeah. Um, I think everyday people, you know, they suffer from an array of issues that can be accommodated. And, you know, there's an array of services and coping mechanisms that people just don't know about. So I think media, it it should be media's responsibility at some point to do a better job of portraying the issues in a light that starts a conversation rather than these people are outsiders and they need to be. Yeah, no, I absolutely okay. agree. OK, I think that's all we have on mental health. So now we're on to our last segment. What would you do? Um, and, and that is uh, kind of focusing on your latest memoir and the Ables. You know, what made you decide to make that jump from YouTube content creation to writing books? Well, I had already written the first Ables book uh, before the YouTube channel happened. Um, And I've always been a writer. I I changed what I write a lot. When I was young, I wrote songs and poems. Uh, Mm -hmm. When I got to college and I got the bug for movies, I I wrote terrible screenplays. Um, And uh, then I was in a band for a while, going back to writing songs. And then I got this idea for the Ables and it just wouldn't, it wouldn't leave. I kept talking about it. And eventually my wife said, you need to write that. It's not, it's, it's haunting you. And I said, you're right. So I did. And then the YouTube channel happened and, you know, the early years, I was just thrilled to be able to actually make money making videos. But then as the audience grew, I realized, wait, there's, I can maybe tell them about this book. I could self-publish this book, maybe. And uh, so that's that's what we did. Um, and then a publisher came along and wanted to pick it up and carry the sequels. And um, I think that just encouraged me to write more. Uh, so I started working on the memoir. I'm, I've got 12 days left to finish <laughs> a murder mystery that I have already sold to the publisher. And I have the fourth Abel's book that I have to write. And I have a collection of sci-fi short stories that one day, maybe in 2024, I hope to polish up and uh, publish those as well. I think. And then we're going to need you to publish all the poems and songs for when you're younger. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, (laughs) I think I've just realized through doing this channel that what I really love both about the YouTube channel and about being creative is writing. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh I am beyond fortunate to be able to do that both for my day job with the videos and my side job with the books. And I hope I don't ever take it for granted. That That's very interesting because um, I'm kind of the same way. I've always had this itch for writing in the back of my head. Um, I have no, you know, uh, like I didn't go to college for writing or anything like that. But same as you, I wrote little dumb songs, uh, poetry when I was in middle school, high school. And then, um, you know, I. Every time I've I've found myself a free time, I've I've found myself trying to start a, a different writing project, never a novel or anything like that, anything long term like that. Uh, but then other things have always trumped it, and and I think it's interesting of how that content creation always just kind of itches at the back of your brain, like when you know you're doing other things, but th- there's this other thing that that you want to be really working on, and and I think that's that's an interesting place to to come from and to want to go. I guess the last thing I'll ask is, do you have one good piece of advice for anyone who wants to create content and do it well? Um, be uh, embrace failure, um, embrace mistakes. Uh, this goes for YouTube content, any other kind of content, and 
I would give the same advice for life. Um, don't be afraid to suck. Don't be afraid to suck because nobody gets it right the first time out of the gate, except for the exception to the rule. Everybody fails, everybody falls, everybody stumbles. And if you don't give yourself room to do that, then uh, you're going to give up too soon and too early. Um, and you know, we tried for almost a year and we had four different channels that we started that all failed spectacularly before we hit this one. So you know, don't give up, but more importantly, embrace the failure because that's how you learn. Nice. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Do you want to give one last plug about, you know, all the stuff you've got going on in case people haven't picked it up throughout this entire episode? Sure. Um, I'll just say my, my next book is a memoir humor book called original sin it comes out on May 18th. It's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble's website. Um, and, uh, you can find me at Twitter at J Scott TN. Um, and, uh, Thank you for having me on this show. Thank you for putting mental health talk in the show notes. It means a lot to me. Um, and I've had a really good time. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming by. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you again to Jeremy for joining me on this week's episode about CinemaSins. You can check out everything CinemaSins uh, on YouTube. And there are also some links in the show notes for this episode. Uh, again, you can follow me on Twitter at APA something and uh, the usual co-host Nick on Twitter at alone underscore podcast. And be sure to check out at Magic 3 TV pod on Twitter for my next podcasting venture uh, where uh, I will be starting the show. The Magic Numbers three when it comes to TV, uh, where we discuss only season three of various shows. Uh, so that's coming up in August or September of this year. Uh, we'll be transitioning over to there. Uh, so thank you for listening. Again, check out everything CinemaSins. It's a really great channel. And thank you always to those cats for providing the music for a podcast about something. Stay classy. Project is key loud.